This week's podcast is sponsored by Morantz, who've been delivering advanced home audio innovations since 1953. Morantz audio products have been designed to reproduce music as it was meant to be heard, because music matters. Find out more about what makes Morantz so special at morantzmoments.com. Hello and welcome to the AV Forums podcast for Monday the 21st of October and joining me on this edition, Steve Withers. Where are you, you spongy, yellow, delicious bastards? And Ed Selly. Time to nut up or shut up. So it's the reduced uh, edition this week. Just or you... the 18, depending on how you look at it. Yeah, or the 18, <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, you ain't getting me in no plane. Right, so we've uh, we've had busy weeks. I know we've had busy weeks because there uh, have been lots going on. Um, we're going to come on to the stuff that we were looking for work-wise, but Ed's got some news. What's the news, Ed? Yeah, uh, it's possible that you're probably hearing a slight echo to uh, my recording at you're the moment. And that is because... Well, uh, not not quite. No, I am sat in the lounge of my new house. Which no is very much there's no furniture, no furniture, curtains, <laughs> it, carpet. Uh, it's no, there's no there's no curtains in here actually. There, there, there's these really, it must be said, quite expensive and ornate slatted blinds, which are lovely. But it, at the moment, it's wooden floors, uh, walls. Uh, and a sofa and a massive rack. Yeah, um, and, and you won't be reviewing echoing. any hi-fi in there then. Uh, well, no, I bought. I, I spent four hundred pounds on a rug on Friday, <laughs> uh, which f- be what? collecting. I spent four hundred pounds you on a say rug. Massive rack. You, are you referring to an equipment rack or a giant pair of bosoms in the lounge with you? <laughs> you remember my quadraspire, yeah. my, the giant one. It's back. It spent 18 <laughs> months in captivity, uh, and it's now um, it's now back so, doing its thing. There's no furniture, but you got that out of storage first. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I know. Everything works. No, uh, so the rug's coming in. How can, uh, a rug, another sofa. How can a rug cost £400, Ed? Tell well, me, get please. a Kia. Get one for 40 quid. Yeah, that's for what For starters... Thinking. It was down from eight hundred pounds, <laughs> and um, we were paddling in the shallow end of what the rug retailer was. There, there were admittedly exquisite stitch stuff, but it was about they were about three and a half grand for the same. I do have a feeling <laughs> that you have taste beyond your means sometimes. Ed. What do you mean sometimes? I always have taste beyond my means. <laughs> but equally, I wanted something in the room which was new. And nice. It's a Nepalese rug. It's uh, beautiful wool with little silk inlays. And, you know, my son has reached the age where I don't think he's going to spill that much stuff on it. Um, and <laughs> I just later really... Later will vomit on it, so look forward to that. <laughs> well, no, I'll probably do that. <laughs> yeah, um, but I, I really liked it. And it's going to sit and I'm going to enjoy my rug. Um, and then there's the sofa turning, another sofa turning up, which will help. And then I, I will look at uh, what, what treatments need to be done once those bits and bobs are in place. But yes, for the moment, it's a little echoey. Live with it. But yeah, no, few, other than that... A few early the, reflections in there. Yeah, the, the, but the move went all right, um, as much as these things can. Um, I've been enjoying the fact that not only have I got a massive shed, which unlike Mr. Botwright's shed is... Which you're not it's living like, in. <laughs> no, exactly. First, yeah. But um, it, it's it's a massive metal shed. I'm so excited to put it on Instagram. Um, and then also, <laughs> this is quite an achievement on my part, considering I came to view this place twice, uh, and it's not that big, but it has an entire giant cupboard, which I hadn't noticed in the viewings. Um, which is great. So it's even more storage. There, yeah, I've just—it's fantastic, you know. And the central heating works. You also works. miss loads of um, other issues in the viewings. <laughs> no, no, no. It's you know how viewings are. When you turn up and the house is empty, you can see everything. So yeah, it's you know certain bits of it are a little bit more worn. That's one of the reasons I've got the rug is because the floor is a bit tatty, and so on and so forth. But no, uh, compared to what I've been living in for eighteen months, it's it's Buckingham bloody palace, and it's fantastic. So yeah, is it happy warm? days. It is at the moment. My central heating is on. I'm sat here in a t-shirt. It's f- I'm sorry, <laughs> beat machine at the ready. It's I've got f- heating on. I'm still wearing three layers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's that's all the houses. I'm the same. Yeah, you, know, you have to sit. Oh, with no, it, no, no, no. Thumbed up full. Previous couple who lived here, I've got invoices to this effect. They spent seven thousand pounds on insulation, both oh. in the roof and the walls. Oh. It does probably mean that I'm going to boil to death in the summer. But it's fabulous. It, after yeah. after eighteen months, it's just the best thing in the history of the universe. 
yeah. after 18 months sitting around two bars on an electric fire. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, I feel I've earned this, and not simply in the fact that I've signed up to pay for it for the next 25 years. <laughs> so, do you, do you yeah, feel your bond days. with it? Uh, I have made it clear if it's at all possible i'd like to go back to the little town that i was living in in the shed just not live in the shed um but this will do for the foreseeable future you know so i've got a pop their clogs and leave you some cash oh i wasn't going to say that no 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 i'm i'm i'm, I'm holding out for um a hero. Uh, I'd, yeah probably <laughs> no I'm, I'm just i'm just gonna f- find find a wealthy lady that, that that seems to be the uh, seems to be the way forward. Um, uh, don't do that; you'll end up getting tired. So I always went wrong. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, it's it, as I say, it, it, it's good, and there's plenty of room for for me and the boy. And uh, I've got a gas hob; that's exciting. Oh, bloody electric hobs! They yeah, they do, do suck balls. Any pussy in the house? Cats. Uh, they turn up on Wednesday. Okay. Uh, but I've got to. I've I, I've got the my bed. Where are they at the moment? Being, they are with my ex-wife. All oh, right. Are they your your cats then? I've been told they are now, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This call it, but I call it, No, mom? Colin belongs to my parents. I would be delighted. I, I would, oh, words oh, could not express how excited I'd be to own Colin, because he's the king of all cats. But, yeah. What are your cats' names? Uh, Andrea and Jim. Oh. But they came pre-named. I did not set out to call a cat Andrea, because that's just weird. It is a bit of a um, weird name for a cat. That. Yeah. But she she does all right with it, and also she's a cat. She doesn't care, so you know that that's all all fine. But no, I've got my bed being. I've got I've got my bed being delivered tomorrow. The boys' bed being delivered on Tuesday. Chester drawers being delivered on Tuesday, and I figured all of that's going to have long phases of the door being open. So I'd, I'm going to wait until it's actually possible to keep them in a level of captivity. Yeah. Otherwise, I suspect I'm just going to lose them. You need to keep them in for a while, won't you, before you can? Uh... Yeah, two weeks. But thankfully, I can stick the litter tray in the mystery cupboard, and, uh, <laughs> and that's less of a problem. So how, how could you miss a cupboard? You might find an entrance to another world. <laughs> uh, well, it's not Narnia. It's just a large and unexpected cupboard, which at the, at the moment looks like a dealer's stock room. It could, be, all the product... it could be a Mr. Ben portal. You could go and do different uh, well, jobs I, every week. I can assure you, I've stood in it. I've rotated around a couple of times, turned the light on and off. I'm afraid no magic has occurred, other than the fact that I, there's an entire large cupboard that I missed on both visits. <laughs> I'm still amazed so, you missed that. So there you go. I, I tend to well, find so, any cupboard like. or room within about ten minutes starts to look like a a you know a dealer's stock room <laughs> full of boxes. Well, the, yeah, this no, actually that. does look like that. Um, and uh, there will be a series of emails going out to uh, a number of people who have had items with me for quite a long time, <laughs> having made no attempt. That to you actually... forgot you had. <laughs> Yes, but equally, certain people have made no efforts to go, Ed, have you got X or Y? Because then I could have checked and sorted it. But now I've got a postal address. There's going to be plenty of opportunities to collect the items. And if not, look out for my eBay account. It's going to be lit. So, uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay, good stuff. Well well done on the move. And, um, yeah, all, all the best. And all the, you know, When your housewarming is, just let us know and we won't bother coming. We won't turn up. <laughs> well, it's, it's a bit, bit of a bit of a schlep for you. I mean, unless I, unless I laid on something tremendous, I, I think your costs in travel. Well, it depends how close out. you are to the pod, really. I mean, it's, Very still. I'm only yeah. four miles back further south. So right, well, next there, time, there you you, next time you go to the pod, you can swing by, swing yeah. by my. Well, there's the pod or the, or the Silverstone. I think the, the one or the other will come up next year. I am sure of yeah. that. So both very close to me. Yeah, there we go. Uh, Steve, what have you been up to? I was dreading you asking this because I really haven't got an answer. Um, not well, a lot. Well, you got the TV that I was looking at last week. Where yeah, stuck, I did which, get that. That's I'm glad. I'm glad you got that because because obviously I forgot to sign out of Netflix and everything else. Obviously I've gone online now and done all that. Uh, but I've got a real habit of doing that when I send TVs back. Um, especially BBC iPlayer as well. I can't find anywhere to log myself out of all devices on that. Um, so it's one of these fallbacks when you're a TV reviewer, isn't it? You, you, yeah. you sign into all these things to test them, and then it's remembering to try and wipe the whole. Normally, I do a fa- factory reset, but I just don't worry. Uh, don't worry. Audio guys can get in on this as well. My Tidal account. Uh, every now and again, I get a recommendation which can clearly only be from someone continuing <laughs> to abuse my Tidal account on something else because I I don't want to listen to your thrash metal. It's not my thing. Yes, but. I did have long enough um, before you changed your account, your logged out of your account to um, to give you some interesting uh, recommendations. Excellent. <laughs> not you. Phil. No, 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 I know. I'm, I'm pleased. I, I, I can't wait to see it. Yeah. So you, you got the TV. Did you get the monitor yeah. to go with it? No, no, just the TV. All right. Yeah. Um, 
I was a bit disappointed actually because I thought I was going to get a 65 inch and it's only 55 inch. So it was. Uh... Oh, first world problem right there. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a bit of an issue because I'd got a mate to come around helping me in anticipation of a big heavy TV. And although well, actually it isn't light for a 55 inch TV. No, that is so one of the, the heavier it's ones. Not the lightest absolutely. one. Although compared to the 984 from Philips, it is, it is a lot lighter. <laughs> that, that was 65 inches and that did weigh Yeah, well, that's, that's why you ended up reviewing that and not me. Ah. Um, anyway, yeah, that came around on Thursday, and uh, Wednesday was interesting because I, I, I have my broadband Wi-Fi is from three, and their entire network went down on Wednesday oh. night and for last parts of the Thursday, so that really bollocks me up. Um, and uh, I've watched a lot of rugby, obviously, this weekend. That's all I've been doing, pretty much. Yeah, I watched uh, some, some of that rugby uh, game as well. It looked quite entertaining. Really good, really good weekend. Uh, rugby, I can't wait for next week's semi-finals. It's going to be epic. A good yeah. game of rugby is a wonderful, wonderful thing. I mean, it has to be said, that, again, what with Phil being English anyway, not a dig, but Scotland-Japan, just in terms of the tempo it was played at, it's still one of the finest games of rugby I can remember seeing in the last five, so ten years. Which... 40 minutes of the Japan North South Africa game, Japan were playing some amazing rugby, and unfortunately they kind of, the South Africans remembered they were much bigger and beat the living day <laughs> out of them in the second half. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Never but, mind. You know, kudos to Scotland, though. You know, they're a very small nation. Actually, small nations do quite well at rugby, don't they? I mean, you've got well, the Welsh. Yeah, Welsh is hardly huge. I, I <laughs> well, well, it's more, it, Scotland's issue is um, like a number of small countries. It doesn't, it hasn't picked a sport. Because let's face it, New Zealand, you've got rugby and then when the weather gets a bit better they play cricket it's, it's very I mean, um, it's very regional Scotland so what you, what you tend to find is that it's football in the central belt uh, the borders where I'm from is extremely he- rugby heavy which is why I hate it because it was, <laughs> it was just constant I mean my the, the headmaster of my school was Jim Telfer who went on to be the <laughs> Scotland manager my PE teacher was Bill McLaren who was the commenta- BBC commentator for rugby. That he gives you was, an idea yeah. of just how much uh, rugby was the thing in my hometown, which is why, I like like most teenagers, I rebelled against it. I wasn't part of the clique. So, uh, it was, it's, I've never gone there, really, with rugby. The other thing, and I, I need to be clear about this, this is not me making a dig about your height. Um, fundamentally, there's only a set number of positions which, as a kid, you would have been suited for. Uh, and the problem is that inevitably, that unless you are that one golden child, there's normally <laughs> someone better at it than you. Yeah, I don't mind saying that my hometown has produced uh, quite a number of uh, very famous um, and, and very, very good rugby players. Um, mm. Stuart Hogg being one of them who's recent in the in the squad at the minute. So there you yeah. go. Um, I'm not going to go down that path. <laughs> the, I've I've made. Uh, are you finished, Steve? Is that you? Yeah, yeah, that was, that was it. Right. Um, I made a quite a a big decision this week, and it's one that's been playing on my mind for um, quite some time now. No, I'm not coming out. But transgender. Uh, nope. <laughs> <laughs> Diet wise, I have decided that I am. Um, uh, over the next six six months, I am cutting meat out of my diet. Okay, um, and and it's taken me a while to come to this decision because if anybody knows me, they know how much I like my meat and and burgers. Is this an attempt like... to offset the carbon footprint of your car? <laughs> no, it's not actually. It's 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 a number of things. Um, carbon footprints being one of them. Um, the fact that what's going on around the world at the minute with uh, clearing for farming and all the rest of it. Plus, I've watched quite a few informed documentaries recently um, that have been pretty down the, down the middle in terms of being fair to each side. Um, and and it doesn't make any sense to me to to keep eating as much meat as, as I am at the moment in my diet because there are alternatives and there are alternatives that are just as tasty and don't cause the issues that mass farming does. As an individual, does. there are two things you can do that would have any kind of real impact on the world situation. Now, one is to stop eating meat, and the other is to not fly, basically. Yep, Those are the two yeah, things yeah. you can do. Everything else is an, at, a, at, a, at a corporate or state level. <laughs> but, but those are the two things yeah. you can do. Yourself. Well, I am, I, just to say, I am all for this. I mean, I'm vegetarian for a couple of nights a week. 
Um, I don't do, I, I haven't cut out meat entirely, it's a decision I've taken. But if you want to, uh, if you need to talk about uh, recipes and stuff, I'm much more, I, it, my vegetarian cooking, because I haven't cut out meat entirely, I don't generally use meat substitutes with the partial exception of corn mints, which I do use from time to time, because depending on what you do with it, it's almost imperceptibly the same as as, the, as, as, as beef mints. But um, if you want to talk about uh, certain vegetarian recipes, I've got loads and I've been thoroughly enjoying them. And done, it, it's it provided that you make the mindset choice uh, change that uh, vegetarian cooking is a much more balanced undertaking because if you just simply take meat and two veg and then have two veg, as you might imagine, it's somewhat unsatisfying. But if you, if you make the prerequisite changes to, to how you prepare food, yeah, it's fantastic. I, I um, think I think the technology's gotten to the stage now as well with food and plant based food and so on that it's gone to the stage now that I have I've bought the you know the the burgers that are made out of plant substitutes and all that and and it, I can't tell the difference when it's in a bun with some relish yeah, and I, onions I, and Laura so maybe on. some corn sausage hot dogs and it wasn't until after I'd scoffed them that she told me that they were, were, weren't sausages yeah, and yeah. I didn't know. <laughs> yeah. I had no idea. Plus, I, I, I've been looking at what I've been eating anyway and, and f- the vast majority of stuff I eat is meat-free anyway. You know, it's just my, my main evening meal where I would have a bolognese. Well, it's quite easy go to have... vegan, though, and stop eggs and that sort of stuff. Not at the moment. No, don't. Not at the moment. I would, but... No, no, no. Can we clear up? You need... In terms... Uh, and I'm undoubtedly we're going going down a minefield of, of, of hideous comments here. You have to be what, extremely on, careful. Listeners, I doubt it. <laughs> You have to be extremely careful vegans because, out there. <laughs> because if you simply go, I'm going to substitute X for Y, certain aspects, I mean, for a particular, some of the milk alternatives are in themselves environmental catastrophes. Mm, yeah, Almond yeah. and soy milk are uh, no less catastrophic to the environment than, than just having some fucking cows, yeah. and at the very least, yeah. I but wear you can also look at it from health perspective. I, I use armor. Well, but that's that's theory. what I'm I'm looking at it all it, for all things. It's not just the environmental issues, which I've been playing on my mind a little bit recently. Um, and obviously, I've watched these documentaries, which have made perfect sense, and there's lots of good science in there as well, which also point to good health and to improving your health and and actually well, taking. Kevin Smith, he's lost a ton of weight. Since yeah, he's been vegan, yeah. Hasn't he? yeah. Yeah, well, exactly all I so. would say is that if Steve, if you choose to lecture me at any stage about any aspects of my life choices, in drinking almond milk, you have participated in one of the irrigation catastrophes of the last thirty years. So enjoy <laughs> that. Right. Okay. I all think, right. I think what about all... hazelnut milk. Can I drink that? I don't f- know. I just drink <laughs> milk. Milk. Was it? Was it? They described it in uh, Parks and Recreation. I drink beef milk. Fantastic! <laughs> you should try it sometime. <laughs> I mean, I don't actually drink it very much. I, 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 I buy a pint of milk. Well, you week. drink black coffee, don't you? Yes, I have. See, but I, I generally drink... have a cup. I have a cup of tea in the afternoon. So I, yeah. I, I essentially, in the course a of a week. Of tea. I, yes, in the course in the course of a, a week, I, I think I drink a third of a pint of milk. <laughs> yeah, I drink a lot of milk because I have lots of milk in tea and coffee. So that's yeah. why I try not to drink milk with my cereal because otherwise I'm just drinking way too much milk. <laughs> Right, I think anyway, we've, uh, anyway. the 84 of <laughs> dietary. <laughs> Can I just say Podcast. I haven't eat, I haven't eaten cereal since I became an adult. Well, oh, when I say cereal, nice. I'm talking like spelt flakes and and you know muesli, but um, muesli. Not, not rice krispies. Oh god, or, or my cocoa god. Pops. I'm sorry. I well, I'd rather eat fucking cocoa pops. <laughs> Can we <make laughs> clear about this? Right, enough. I think we better talk about some AV, otherwise people are going to be switching off if they haven't already quite quickly. Uh, right, so current competitions, we've got loads of competitions. We can't mention them all, so I've kind of just bunged the, uh, the, the the best ones or the better ones together, uh, but there are loads of them there. So if you go to avforums.com forward slash competitions, uh, there is a big list. I think there's about 25 running as we speak at this moment in time, but we're going to go through the list quickly. We'll each take one. I'll start Steve next, then Ed. So win a copy of X-Men Dark Phoenix on 4K Blu-ray ends 29th October. Win a copy of Men in Black International on 4K Ultra HD. That ends also on the 29th of October. Win a copy of Angel Heart on 4K Ultra HD, which ends a day later on the 30th of October. Win a copy of Shadowhunter Season 2 on Blu-ray 30th of October. Cracking prize here. Win a Yamaha Music Cast Bar 400. I've reviewed that. It's excellent. Worth £649. And that also finishes, that finishes on the 31st of October. 
Win a World of Warships starter pack worth £15, and there's an unlimited number to one, the win. So enter and you win, basically, and it's worldwide, and that ends on the 31st of October. Win copies of Criterion's October titles. Don't know what they are. There's usually three of them. On Blu-ray, if you want to know what they are, go to the website. Ends 12th of November. And finally, uh, on mine just arrived this weekend, actually, win a copy of Scarface on... That's the... Brian De Palma version, not the 1930s version. Scarface on 4K Ultra HD, and that finishes the day before, actually, uh, the 11th of November. Right. Lots of competitions uh, are open and being added daily. So head over to avforums.com forward slash competitions to enter even more. And they're all eligible to uh, eligible, sorry. They're, all competitions are open to eligible AV Forums members resident in the UK. It's basically everyone except Phil. We've covered this many times. Okay. Seeing as you're stumbling over your words, let's have the previous competition winners. <laughs> <laughs> right, Simon Blue wins a copy of Rabbit on Blu-ray. Sharon 103 wins copies of Criterion September titles on Blu-ray. Bam Aussie, BM, BA Mozzie, wins a copy of Jackie Chan's Police Story and Police Story 2 on Blu-ray. Manjit, all capitals, wins a copy of We the Animals on Blu-ray. Lotus and Lan wins a copy of Curse, The Last Mission on Blu-ray. Clunk wins a copy of Arrow, the complete seventh season on Blu-ray. Cook.Alex wins a copy of Rocket Man on 4K Ultra HD. And uh, Muljayo wins a copy of Lockup on 4K Ultra HD. So, well done to you all. Yeah, well done. Excellent. There was loads uh, waiting in the system when I went in this week, which is nice. Loads of competition winners. There'll probably be none next week, but there you go. Uh, <laughs> right, so if you want to enter the competitions, just a reminder, it's avforums.com forward slash competitions. That, like I said, there's around about 25 of them at the minute, if, if, if I've got my numbers right. Uh, so lots for you to enter there. And we'll be back in a sec with hardware. <laughs> Right, okay, moving on to hardware. We've got some reviews this week. Uh, both myself and Steve have been looking at Philips TVs. I've been looking at the OLED 854, which was announced last year, but coming to market now. Typical Philips fashion, it's turned yeah, up a bit late. It has a little bit. And Steve's been looking at the uh, the flagship uh, 984. So we'll come back to the 984 towards the end because it's, it's, it's roughly the same type of thing. I'm not going to say that they use the same panels because I, I've i looked at them and I think there is slight differences there. Yeah, because so. if it was announced last year, I'm guessing that's last year's panel, same as a 754. Um, is that you, right? You know what? I didn't use my little eyepiece to check. Hey, hey, I should, what I should have done that. Third gen P5 or second? it's third. It's third gen P5, oh, okay. and it's uh, Dolby Vision and uh, HDR10 plus. Really nice TV. I've got to say, I it, it doesn't have Bowers and Milken sound on it. Um, the sound is just normal downward firing speakers within the panel. Nicely designed. It swivels on the stand. So the difference between the 854 and the 804... Rarity these days, isn't it? Yes. TV does that. Um, <laughs> it was such a good idea. Why did they stop doing it? I don't know. And it's a really, really neat idea the way that they, they do it. So, Because I didn't realise it, it, it swiveled to start with because I just screwed this, the stand in at the back. So it's, it's got the uh, the like a silver bar to the front, uh, then a bar that goes back and then into the central part of the back panel although it had um, large screws that didn't come all the way out they were actually fixed so you just screwed them into the back of the TV and it wasn't until I lifted it up that suddenly the, the stand moved and I thought oh what's happened here and uh, and it actually it swivels so it's designed to swivel that way the 804 is exactly the same TV same panel everything but it has the 90 degree little stands that the uh, 903 had last year. That is the difference. That's the only difference is the stand. They're exactly the same TVs. The 854 is available through Costco. The 804 is on general release through a number of retailers. And I believe Costco have have it for a few months uh, before it's available elsewhere. But like I say, identical TVs. It's just a stand. It's a bit different. So let's go into picture quality. Um, really quite surprising. Actually, if you are familiar with Philips, you're familiar with the uh, coverage that we have from their events and so on, and um, their picture guru, Danny Tack, you know that Danny's very much a uh, video processing side of things, edge adaptive, edge enhancement, upscaling te techniques, uh, motion plus soap opera effect. That's Danny's thing. Uh, Danny's very, very good at what he does. It's not necessarily our cup of tea. 
uh, when it comes to enthusiast side of things because you want most of the processing switched off. Um, so in the past, Philips TVs have been predominantly more towards uh, people who like bright, vivid modes with smooth motion and so on. But the Philips TVs do have ISF modes in them. They also come with uh, calibration controls. And out of the box, I've got to say that the, uh, the review sample I had for the 854, and it was a brand new retail pack that hadn't been messed with in any way. Um, so I've no doubt that um, these TVs will be very, very similar. Although you do get panel variants from TV to TV, they will be quite similar. So just over 70% stimulus in terms of the grayscale, it went over the visible threshold. So in the brighter reaches of the image, it's a little bit yellow. And I mean very, very slightly yellow. It's a little bit, just a little bit too warm for where we want to be because D65 is warm. Exactly the same on the 984. Yeah, it's just a little bit warm from 70% upwards. And the grayscale uh, otherwise is really quite nice. It's only losing a little bit of blue energy and the gamma tracks a little bit too bright and again, at the brightest part of the image. But you're talking like 2%. You're not going to see that really. Uh, and not at that end of the, of the spectrum. Um, out of the box in terms of Rec. 709, again, um, very, very good in terms of 75% and under stimulus. There was a little bit of uh, track with magenta towards red uh, in terms of hue on the graph. But again, with actual viewing material, I, I didn't notice it. Um, it wasn't glaringly obvious like skin tones were were how I expected them to look. Um, they weren't overly red or overly pink or so on. Green, again, slight hue error on the graph, but again, nothing that I saw during normal viewing. And then when it came to calibration, we were talking at like under one. In fact, I think it was 0 0.9 was my average delta E. Uh, nice and flat, right across the board. Again... Uh, 20 point calibration? Yeah, point two, 2 and 20. That's new. Um, yes, it is new. Um, I only used the two point though. Uh, it got it bang on when it needed to be. I didn't need to spend the time balancing it out. Again, Gamma at 80 and 90 stem was a tad bright, but again, nothing you're going to notice in actual material. Quickly moving on to HDR, this is where it really impressed me because I've looked at lots of OLEDs recently and um, the most accurate I've seen is, is, the, uh, is the Panasonic uh, GZ2000. In fact, the Panasonics, all the Panasonics I've seen have been really quite accurate, but when it came, comes to HDR, they're not quite there when it comes to uh, the colour gamut. The Philips was absolutely bang on, spot on where it needed to be, out of the box. The slight points here and there, it doesn't quite reach uh, the full green, it doesn't quite reach um, full yellow, but apart from that it hits every other point and saturation tracking again hits every single point, which I've seen no other OLED TV manage that um, this year. They're there or thereabouts, but it's usually a little bit less in terms of coverage, especially saturation side. Obviously colour volume side you are losing out with OLED, that's accepted, we, we all know that nowadays, um, but again colour reproduction with HDR content was excellent when it comes to peak uh, brightness again peak brightness is one of these things that it only tells you a very very small indicator as to picture quality there's lots of other things that add into HDR like I say color gamut as well as you know the um, tone mapping if it's done dynamically if it changes its tone map depending on uh, the max CLL data it gets and so on so there are differences manufacturers do it slightly different uh, but in terms of peak, 2% uh, and 5% windows, they were over 750 nits. And the, the industry standard, which is 10%, it was 706, which for an OLED TV is very, very good. Very good indeed. Um, but like I say, it's only one aspect of that. In terms of its uh, tone map, it's definitely gone. It's definitely been designed to try and keep as much detail as possible. So like like we keep saying in, in the podcast and, and the reviews, you've got to think of it as a curve and up to about 100 nits is the same as SDR and then you have your specular highlights and everything else on top of that. Um, and it does very well. It gets to about 200 nits brightness and then it has a, a fairly steep roll off towards the 700 nits maximum, but in such a way that um, it's almost linear when you look at the line, to be honest. Um, and it's it's seen in the content. So I would say from about 90% brightness and higher, 90% stem and higher within an HDR image, it's hard clipping. So you get no details at the really high end, but up to about 80% brightness, 
Um, it's very, very good indeed. Very uh, detailed. Um, and I've got to say, again, it's it's the same panels as the Panasonic, but Panasonic have managed to get the cyan tint out of it this year, whereas the Philips still has that cyan tint to whites. vast majority of viewers looking at the screen in isolation will never, ever see that that issue, Steve. But when you've got two side by side, it's a little bit more obvious when it comes to, to yeah. white balance and so on. And apart from that, yeah, upscaling, absolutely spot on. Motion brilliant the motion really impressive um and and they do it two ways they've got two different uh pull down modes so if you have motion switched off um so there's they're doing a slightly different pull down for uh, without adding interpolation and switching between the two it'll depend on what material you're, you're looking at but i had no issues with uh, with motion at all with 24 frames per second material or uh, 25 frames for that uh, using Pal the TV. movie mode motion setting uh, I, I used movie for tv viewing so 1080i i used it for that because i thought it looked better uh, but with 24 frames per second i had it switched off there's no right. need to have it on um, with 24 frames. It does it does five five pull down properly. Um, what else was there? If you want to add motion, if you want to add edge enhancement, if you want to add all the bells and whistles, you can do the the menu system is probably the the most complicated menu system of any TV, and they've made it more complicated this year because rather than just clicking on settings, you've got to click on the right the side, quick, the quick menu button, the quick menu. Then, then you go, go across <laughs> frequently, frequent, frequent use frequent something or other, yeah. frequent use it, and then go down then to the bottom, pictures, yeah. <laughs> advanced yeah. settings, and then you finally get there, yeah. which is a real pain. Yeah, and they also. Yeah. Um, they name certain things slightly differently from every other manufacturer. So where they say contrast, that's actually the backlight or in yeah. this case the OLED light setting. And then it's vid- what would video. normally be called contrast is called video contrast. Yeah. 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 And uh, I had an opportunity to sit next to the X300, the BVM X300 master monitor from Sony. And other than the Panasonic, this was also the, the only other OLED that got pretty close to looking very, very similar. Using the Spears and Mansell a uh, thousand nits, it looked really, really good. Interesting. Um, not quite as detailed because obviously you're talking about 30 inch RGB OLED. Uh, it, it's it's got three fans on the back. It's blowing out loads of loads of heat because it's it's pumping that thousand nits into the panel. You're not going to match that with uh, with a TV of this level. But in terms of tonality and hues and so on, um, it looked very very good when it was next to the master monitor. So well done, Philips. I mean, it's really really nice looking TV. Um, the image quality, if you're looking for accuracy, which has sometimes been an issue with Philips, I, I have no problems with it whatsoever. There's no backdoor processing going on when you're in the ISF modes or anything like that. So um, so yeah, well done to Philips. It's, a, it's an excellent OLED TV. And I think they're pretty fairly priced as well at the minute. So that's the mid-range, which is the 854 or the 804, identical TVs. So Steve, you had the flagship. I did, uh, which is perhaps not quite so competitively priced. Uh, the 65, no. there is only one screen size, 65 inch, and um, it's four and a half thousand quid. So basically the same kind of price point as the 65 inch GZ2000. Um, my experience with it is largely the same as yours in terms of the uh, out-of-the-box settings, the picture accuracy, the performance with um, HDR. It actually was slightly brighter in HDR. I, I measured it at 815 nits on a 10% window, which makes it the second brightest after the GZ2000. Um, so that's impressive. It's, um, yeah, performance-wise, absolutely stellar. Um, the SDR and HDR performance was fantastic. The uh, processing, as you said, Phil, um, you can turn it off, obviously, for set ISF. Everything, almost everything's turned off, um, which is good. But if you want to use it, it works really well. And um, it's got, uh, you know, the new latest version of Android, which, unlike Sony, works properly, which is good news. So no I delays, this, no stalls, and no crashes. This... Well, it's, it's actually, actually to, to be honest, the um, audio on the Sony yeah. is, is it's absolutely got better. It's, it's, it's the got same better. as the Philips, basically, on audio. Philips have done it better in the past because they have They've a, used more processing power. More processing. Yeah, they, they use yeah. a different studio tech processor, basically. Um, I'm not going to defend Sony because, they, you know, for years, it's not like this is a recent thing. It's been going on for years. They were not putting enough processing power in their TV, which is why it was so slow and kept crashing. They also only had two out of four HDMI inputs that were fully specced. At least Philips... They put enough processing power in, and all four HDMI inputs were fully specced, and in fact, all four even yeah, support ARC, ARC don't yeah. they? Um, as well as ALLM. So, um, yeah, that's good. It's, uh, the case of the 984, it's got four-sided Ambulite, so if you're a fan of Ambulite, you get it in all four sides, not just three, which is what normally happens. Um, and it comes with the bespoke B&W speakers, 3.1 channel speakers. Now, this is the bit that really sets it apart from everything else. This is, without doubt, hands down, 
the best sounding television I've ever heard. It sounds superb. It sounds really good. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you, I got it. I can. I mean, because I had it that last week, and this week I've had the GZ uh, 2000, which you know is meant to have a pretty good sound system. It it doesn't even get close, <laughs> not even close. And even though the GZ 2000 has got upward firing drivers, the 984 wipes the floor with it. I mean, there's depth to the G984, real depth to the sound. Even I mean, it has the option you can plug in a uh, subwoofer if you want to, and you can do that with the GZ 2000 as well. But um, even without a sub. There's real bass to that speaker system, and it's got real depth to it. The Panasonic just sounds thin in comparison, completely thin. With, um, without a subwoofer, it does, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, no, and it's very, fr- very front-heavy as without well. Without a subwoofer on the Philips, it still sounds beefy, and, 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 and it's got some real weight to the sound. It sounds fantastic, unbelievable. I mean, that's what you're paying for with the four and a half grand price point. Um, so aside from the price, I, I'm, I could hardly fault it. It's just a fantastic television. Absolutely, it looks gorgeous, beautiful. Big, are, you, big... are you restricted with the design? This is what I was going to come on to, Steve, because yeah. it is designed to sit on a pedestal stand, isn't well, it? Well, no, um, you can wall mount it. All right, okay. So basically, uh, if you buy, when you get the TV, it comes and you have to assemble it, obviously. Um, the way it looks, if you assemble it with the stand, you've got a big, um, very heavy, and I think that's fair enough, you want it to support it and be robust. So it's got a very heavy metal stand. Then it's got like a metal, metal column. And you, you take um, the, the metal column, it looks like when you've got it assembled, it looks like the, the column goes all the way up to the back of the TV. And then attached halfway up the column is the speaker, which is big, you know, it's the width of the, of the, of the TV. And it's a 65-inch TV, so it's a pretty, you know, it's a big speaker, proper big full-size speakers here. And they've got um, tweeters, left and right tweeters are inside, but the center to its channel tweeter is above the speaker. Uh, built into the column so it, it looks like one complete unit but if you're wall mounting it just below where the speaker is you can detach that's where you attach and detach it from the, the the actual base of the stand so you can detach it there and then there's a dedicated mount that attaches to that um, column that's still attached to the tv and the speaker because the speaker is attached to it permanently um, and then and you attach that to the tv so basically if, you, if you're looking at a photograph and unfortunately in the review i didn't have any lifestyle shots of it wall mounted and i don't think there were any wall mounted at the show either um at the um at IFA. so um if you look at a photograph of it on a stand imagine that the, the bit below the speaker isn't there that's how it would look when wall mounted so yeah it, it, it does come with a dedicated stand so you can wall mount it but people i think were asking you know how is this you know the the speaker itself and the tweeter because the tweeter is actually built into the column that supports it so that's all part of it and, and you can't detach that it's part of the tv essentially but i below did look the speaker, at that tweeter and i wondered if i'm sure that doing it that way does make for a performative advantage yes. but it does also give that bmw styling cue that they probably wanted to slip in there <laughs> because if you think about it, the other two tweeters are inside um but yeah, yeah they obviously it's obviously a shout out to the the 800 series and things like that with the tweeters on top but yeah, it looks great i mean and it's a, it's a it's a very very attractive television it's really well made weighs an absolute ton if you are going to yeah. warm out make damn sure you walk and take the weight <laughs> um so it's, yeah, a, so it's in- interesting from the side sound side of things as well because this is the first time that uh bows and wilkins have actually had the uh, the ability to take a, a clean piece of paper for their sound system. Yeah. And the reason for that was that the 903 from last year, it had the, the Bowers and Wilkins sound bar, but that space was the only space that yeah. was available they and they had to fit it space. into yeah, that. Yeah. This was this was them with no compromises. This is them just like, what can we do? Yeah, and it's uh, properly now, clearly, decoupled from the TV as well. So yeah, that's going to yeah, make exactly. a big so the difference. The whole speaker is decoupled from the TV and is attached to the column below the television. And then both the TV and the speaker are attached to the same column. And then, again, decoupled from the speaker is the center channel tweeter, which is attached to the column above. Um, now, clearly, four and a half grand, you could easily buy a... a, a well, you could get the 934, which uh, comes with uh, its own soundbar and up with fine drivers. So that's a bit more like the GZ2000 in that sense. Um, or you can get something like the one you just reviewed, Phil, save yourself a lot of money and then buy you know, a sound system of your own. So clearly that is the option. Yeah. But if you wanted everything in one unit, uh, you won't find a better sound TV. <laughs> I guarantee it. Well, then it's good that you've had the GZ 
um, this week to to compare as well because that's something that I haven't had the opportunity to do. So at least we know now that which is the best, better sounding TV. So uh, so yeah, that's interesting. And again, if it's if it's anything like the eight five four, you know, out of the box accuracy and so on, I think people will be very very it's happy. Identical. Um, yeah. uh, from what you just described, I'm looking at the graphs in my review now. Absolutely identical to what you just described. All right. So do, do I need to unbox this OLED nine three four that I have here then because it's still sitting in the box. <laughs> <laughs> If they're all the same. Well, it, the audio side will be interesting. <laughs> it will be because it's a smaller... Yeah. This is the uh, one with the upward firing yeah. drivers, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that'll be yeah, interesting. Yeah, because the thing about the uh, the 984, interestingly, the 934 has uh, a 3.1.2 system. So there's three forward firing drivers. They're sort of built in sub, and I use that term loosely. You know, it's like a, a little woofer in the back of it. And it's got two actual upward firing drivers. So it delivers Atmos with genuine overhead effects. The uh, 984 doesn't have any upward firing drivers. So it's got three forward firing drivers and i mean i mean three full fully specced forward firing speakers uh, and a woofer built in at the back and um it uses psychoacoustic processing to give more of an atmos effect to atmos but i've got to say comparing that like the you know the amaze trailer at the beginning you know that, yeah. that, uh, that atmos trailer listening to that on the uh, 984 and then listening to it with upward firing drivers on the gz2000 there was absolutely no comparison <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Just and and obviously, yeah, people listening, and we are aware that you know we're talking about four and a half thousand pounds, and I think the, uh, the well, the sixty-five inch GZ is is only a couple hundred pounds under that. Um, yeah. So they're very, very similar price-wise. We do realise that you can go out and buy an AVR and speaker system, oh, cool. yeah. very, very, very good AVR and speaker system for that kind of money as well, and get a. a, a I mean, you could literally go and buy like a GZ 950 65 inch yeah. and the uh, Samsung HW Q90. 7.1.4 yeah. soundbar system and still have change <laughs> yeah. from four and a half grand. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so, so there yeah, are no, plenty of options. That's not what it's aimed at people who want, you know, a flagship luxury product in one complete package. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, a lot of people are downsizing these days as well. So these kind of things where uh, they maybe have to downsize from a 7.1 or a 5.1 system, uh, at least the 984 is giving them, uh, like you say, a quality product, a luxury product uh, with, with quite a high end speaker attached as well. So, yeah, I can see it finding a market. It is expensive, though. There's no getting away from that. And it's the same with the GZ2000 as well. For, for what you're getting in terms of picture quality, there's not that big a leap up. But obviously, the, the, there are other things attached, like the speakers and so on. Right, so TV-wise, uh, that's us up to date. Like I say, I've got the 934 here. It's still in the box. It, I intend to get out this week. When's the... Um, obviously, it was mentioned in the comments as well, so it's not purely selfish me asking this. Um, Steve, you've made reference there's some sort of attack on the budget. OLED market from Philips due imminently, or if, am I missing it? It's already on? available. Um, yeah, it's been out a few I'll, weeks. I'm looking at Amazon. Oh, I'll me. Give me a second. I'll tell you how much it cost you. Well, I'm just looking at this 55 in this in this room, and it just looks a little lost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, there's plenty. Too big a telly. Yeah, there's there's plenty of deals to be had at the minute because the uh, the 950, the 55 inch. GZ 950. That's 1299 now. So that's gone down to 1299. But the 55 inch, I'm just seeing if they've got the 65 inch available. Um, that's a hell of a price, isn't it? Is that for the, the name? It is. is. The, the, the 55 inch 754 from Philips, 1299 now on, oh, yeah. uh, on Amazon. It'll be a grand by, uh, by uh, Black Friday. Yeah. Um, yeah, so like I say, we've got loads of TV still to come as well. Um, the GZ2000 review, it's written up and so on. I know I'm late with it. It's just the video's turned into an absolute monster. Uh, because of all the you know the comparisons that I wanted to do and so on, um, it's taken me a little bit longer to edit that than I wanted it to take. The reviews are written up; it's all ready to go, uh, so that should be out by the time you're listening to this podcast, uh, or within Oops, so. a day of that. Anyway, the nine eight four is uh, it's up on the homepage already, so that's a Philips nine eight four. Steve did that review; that's up on the homepage, and like I say, the eight five four that should be towards the end of this week as well. Nice easy video that one, uh, so that should be towards the end of the week. You want to say something, Steve? I was going to say, I answered Ed's question. You can get the 65 inch 754 for 1799. That is ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's- Okay. Although that doesn't come with Android, does it? It's the uh, it's... Uh, no. I don't know. That's a massive loss, though. You get Safi instead, but uh, you still get HDR10 plus. You get Amos. You get Dolby Vision. Uh, you know, you can't argue with that, can you? Yeah. No. I mean, as I say, this fit. 
I mean, oh, it's I've got built in, it's got built in um, Amazon, Amazon Echo, um, Amazon Alexa as well. All right. Well, Excellent. I won't be turning that on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. I think Black Friday is going to be uh, the big thing this year. I think there's going to be lots. If you if you're sitting on the fence for OLED at the moment, I think this Black Friday might be the time to jump because I think there's going to be some real bargains out there. Um, and it's certainly looking at the price and price erosion and so on, and looking where we are <laughs> with Brexit, <laughs> Brexit and other things. Um, yeah, I think uh, I think there's some bargains to be had. Absolutely, this Black, uh, Black Friday. Yes, I totally agree. Uh, I think there's going to be if you're looking if you've been holding off buying an OLED, then the next next month will be the time to do it. <laughs> yeah, watch this now. Though there won't be any bargains. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, let's move on. Let's talk a, a little bit about some music and music services. We keep coming back to this from time to time because things do move on. Services do change. They get some. Some of them get better. Some of them get pretty poor from a strong start and I'm looking at Tidal here. So there's a, a new boy or a new kid on the block Ed in terms of high yes. high end music or HD music and that's from Amazon. So you've been playing around with it. What did you think? Yeah. Well first up let's face it if we were sat around a table or podcast if you were, had asked which streaming service was most likely to next make the leap to high resolution streaming i'm going to stick my neck up here and i'm going to say that like like me i don't know if you'd have necessarily selected amazon as the most likely cam- candidate no. because they've been uh, if we take amazon's uh tv service to be a case in point they are fundamentally risk averse it's i mean they've got some interesting content of their own i don't wish to 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 belittle them in any way but it i don't know i don't believe i played about with it earlier is there any single aspect of amazon's tv service which you regard as an innovate an innovative feature or is it uh, like as far as i can work out it's uh, fundamentally a selection of best and not so best practice cobbled together from other people yeah that's probably about right plus also right. a very annoying habit of not letting you telling you where the, the 4k stuff is right well good news they have corrected that in the music service they make it abundantly clear where you're listening to high res content or ultra hd as amazon calls it which grates a little but uh, if you've been peddling 320k mp3s as decent you have to start choosing other other uh descriptive terms to make it all make sense but nevertheless completely i I mean i i i I don't know i'm sure that somebody somewhere might have got wind of this but pretty much with no fanfare amazon hd uh, music hd has, has has appeared and it does an awful lot right um there is a full review in the works but the long and the short of it is that um like uh tidal and cobuzz you have uh the option to listen to cd 1644 versions of large swathes of music but there is a significant quantity of material available in resolutions between 24 44.1 and 24 192 um I am obligated to point out that Amazon says to 24.192 at no stage in quite a uh, quite a hefty amount of listing have I actually found anything in 24.192. So I don't know what's there. Um, it, for the most part, everything seems to top out at 24.96. But um, the big deal here is that uh, Tidal to their eternal credit have kept their streaming service pegged at £20 a month including access to the MQA encoded masters. Cobuzz has finally uh, released uh, a monthly subscription including high res which they're now calling Studio which is £25 a month. If you're an Amazon Prime subscriber this service is 13 quid a month. Um, so three quid more than Spotify, basically, and it's it's full high res. And furthermore, um, having done some tests, because I am a sad bastard and I've got subscriptions to all of them, I'm going to stick my neck out here. They've got more high res than Tidal. And furthermore, their high res isn't MQA encoded. It just runs as normal. Now, they don't have everything their own way. If you're using the app to send material to an external source whereas Tidal and Cobuzz have got little USB tricks for both Mac and PC where you can set up a direct connection between the streaming service and your DAC 
Amazon doesn't have that at the moment. And their third party integration pretty much begins and ends with Blue Sound at the time of recording. But it seems abundantly clear from the press material that they've already put on the website that they are on the mother of all charm offensives to um, add to this third party integration. And I have to be honest, the app itself works really rather nicely. Uh, they clearly mark the high res content. Uh, they clearly tell you what resolution it should be in, which is something that Tidal still won't do. And um, the iPad and Android apps are perfectly respectable as well. And you might sort of be going, well, why does this matter? From my perspective, you know, in my sad little hi-fi world, uh, this is a big deal because this is the point where we return to a, a phenomenon that was last really seen in CD, where we're approaching the point again where the most convenient form of method of listening to music is also the highest quality. And so many things have had to happen for this to actually be practical. We've had to improve broadband speed. We've had to improve data allowances for mobile users. We've had to improve storage capacity and so on and so forth. But Amazon's gamble, going back to this risk aversion, is that you can sign up for this service and it's no more onerous to use if you don't care than it the, the compressed rivals. But it finally gives people especially with the, the you know the the, the wiretaps the echo dot and the rest of it because they have a, a further discounted access to this service they if you're you know if you're 12 years old and your parents have got this service they might not be terribly interested in hi-fi but suddenly in the same way that i as a kid and so many other people my age as a kid they had access to high quality material in the form of cds in the form of records or whatever it comes back to normalizing access to high quality content in the same way again with the caveats of compression quality and so on and so forth people who are interested in film and tv at the very least have got the streaming services to support an interest in 4k in in, in high dynamic range and all the rest of it i don't want to get too excited because there's there's any number of you know, people going, oh, f it's three pounds more than, than Spotify. I'm not paying that and so on and so forth. But nevertheless, it just normalizes or goes one further step to normalizing access to, to high quality content. And I, I, I have to say, I find that really exciting. I've stunned you into silence or, or cool. unconsciousness, <laughs> one or the other. No, I just had a mouthful of nuts. <laughs> what are you, you doing? You're your 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 <laughs> <laughs> But yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. If you um, you don't need to be a fanatical opponent of Amazon's business policies to not use it at the moment. If your equipment has native support for Tidal or Cobuzz, there's no point changing at the moment. Um, if I was Tidal right now, I think I'd be slightly concerned because uh, I I think that Amazon's going to probably start hoovering up some of the less completely committed um, users of, high, of, of, of lossless and high-res streaming. Um, I think that Cobuzz has enough bells and whistles, especially with the online store and so on and so forth, to make it slightly less vulnerable. But n nevertheless, I mean, depending on how aggressively Amazon pursue it, who knows? I mean, this could be a, a complete category destroyer. But nevertheless, if you were just wanting to dip a toe in lossless streaming, especially just if you're doing it from a, a, a PC or Mac, it, it's very hard to ignore just how good it is. Yeah, but does anybody want it? Well, now this is an interesting thing, but going back to Amazon's business model historically, they wouldn't have bothered unless they thought there was something in it. Is my, it I, I mean, I suspect they've looked at the market. Amazon, sorry, Apple and Spotify are locked in a death spiral at the compressed end of the market, Apple's going to win because Apple does things other than lost the streaming, which will bankroll it to the point where Spotify's investors post float will go, we can't be bothered with this anymore. Uh, and what happens to it after that is a matter of conjecture. But unfortunately, just looking at the bold numbers, Spotify has already lost. Um, so if you are seeding the compressed tier to Apple, 
you have to do something else. And I think what Amazon has done is probably the correct thing to do. Okay, that's interesting. It's just, I, you know, I know my circle of friends out with AV and all the rest of it, quite happy with uh, compressed Spotify and the fact that they can use Spotify on loads of different devices. So and I'm just, I'm just wondering... When I, Spotify, when I say that Spotify's already lost, if if I was a gambling person, which I'm not, when I say Spotify is lost, I suspect Spotify will be purchased by another entity, and my gut feelings for that to happen would be either Microsoft or Google. It's too good not to simply to, to just simply die. But in terms of its ability to stand on its own, Apple has just dis- I mean, if you look at the subscriber numbers in the US in particular. Apple has robbed them of the number, the basic numbers that they made public that they needed for the service to work. So, unfortunately, I, I think it, it it doesn't happen immediately. But the game in the in the longer term, the game's up. The only thing I would say, um, and this is conjecture on my part, but I suspect that there might be some mileage in it. I, if I was designing a streaming service like this. I would have made it so that the Amazon Prime TV integration that Amazon has pushed into televisions right, left and centre one is one firmware update away from being able to do the music as well. It's just my, just my thought on that. Um, I suspect it might be possible to use the television as your graphics interface and your, and your, and your driver and control it via remote or whatever and fire it out to sound bars, external speakers, so on and so forth. And I, I, whether that makes a difference, I don't know. And I can't prove that. It's just that if I was going to this effort, that's what I'd do. Yeah, it all makes sense. And it's going to be interesting to see which way you know, it goes in the next few months. Um... Well, speaking of Apple, their TV service starts in 10 days, isn't it? First of November. Somewhere. Yeah. No, okay. in the UK, I think. We get it in the UK oh, as really? well. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah, unlike Disney, who seem to have dropped the ball a little oh, bit. Oh, sorry, I got that like, confused. Yeah. Uh, Apple uh, will be available from 1st November in the US and the UK, I'm sure, just about everywhere else as well. Um, but Disney, unfortunately, <laughs> given that's the one I actually want, uh, won't be with us until, what, the new year? I think January. So I'm hearing January sometime. Hopefully it will be great. Okay. Well, we might get more on that um, towards well, the end. We can... I'm just I'm just looking through my lunch pad. I thought the I've just updated my Mac because we had a few issues before we started the. the You've podcast. got the Apple TV app there now. No, it's not there, and iTunes is oh. still here, which I I thought iTunes was no more. So no, it, it isn't. It isn't. So are you sure you got the latest version? Cause yeah, it's just updated. You got Catalina. It took away. I've got. Um, well, when you say iTunes, do you mean you can see the little um, Clef music logo? Yeah, I haven't tried to yeah, open that's it up Apple yet. Music now. That's Apple Is it? Music right, now. Okay. Yeah, and there's Apple Podcasts and Apple TV. All right. Yeah. We had a, we had, oh, we had so a... I was worried about this. So it means that presumably when my dad wants to rip something now, he's bollocks. Uh, well, no, iTunes is still there. I mean, in the sense that you can still rip things. What it's done though is I've lost all of my album art, so I'm actually really pissed off. <laughs> I, I didn't use iTunes, so I, I wouldn't have that issue. It's just, it was just interesting because we had a, well, obviously had an issue at the beginning of the podcast where the call recorder disappeared because I'm updated. It wasn't But there. can you not see a little Apple TV logo on your. Uh, no, it's not there. Oh, so strange. I'll have to have a look at that. Uh, Should be there somewhere. Have a look in the launch pad. So, you know. Yeah, well done. Right. Uh, that's it for hardware. We'll be back in a sec with some movies. Okay, moving on to films. No review. The Kaz was supposed to be on the podcast tonight, but things have, haven't turned out that way, and he was going to review a film that you got in the cinema to see, but I haven't been to the cinema this week. It seemed Land. No, no, it was um, Maleficent oh. too. Oh, we went, oh, that's right. Yeah, he didn't yeah. go and see Zombieland. That was, um, I am seeing Zombieland, Double Tap, and another film we're about to talk about in a second on Wednesday, but unfortunately at this point I haven't seen it. I didn't see anything this week now. I'm just glad it's opening on a Wednesday because I, I, yeah. I don't like a Friday, I don't like a weekend opening because trying to get to the Metro Centre on a weekend, especially when this time of year when it's chucking it down the rain, it's an absolute nightmare. But Wednesday it'll be it'll be deserted, so I'll be going to see uh, Terminator Dark Fate uh, when it opens yep. on Wednesday. Uh, not holding up much hope for it. Going in with expectations on the floor. Um, hasn't looked great in the trailers, has it? No, it hasn't. No. I know it's got like James Cameron come up with the story, but he didn't actually write it. Uh, 
I think he's got eight different writers, so that's a good, not a good sign. Uh, it's directed by Tim Miller, who directed Deadpool, so he knows how to direct an action sequence. Um, but listening to the reading the plot line here, Sarah Connor and a hybrid Sarah Connor and a hybrid cyborg human must protect a young girl from a newly liquid a newly modified liquid Terminator from the future. That sounds like the, the plot of Terminator Two. <laughs> it does a bit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and it's going to be interesting to see how because obviously. Arnie. Schwarzenegger, and this is not a spoiler because it's in the trailer. Uh, Schwarzenegger is in there for some the reason. So, yeah, so <laughs> yeah, Schwarzenegger's around. Um, well, they did, they, that, this isn't new, is it? Because they did the, the old, the aging. Um, if you had seen the previous Terminator film, uh, Genesis, Schwarzenegger is in that as well as an as a as a cyborg now because the flesh ages yeah. even if the yeah. the robot doesn't. And so he played a played a T one thousand or T no was it T eight hundred isn't it um, in that. They seem to be doing the same thing here again <laughs> with an aging Schwarzenegger, and let's be honest, a quite an aging Linda Hamilton too. So, yeah, I'm going to go and see out of curiosity, but I can't say it's something else. anyone was crying. I mean, what's this? The sixth? Hang on, one, two, three. Four, uh, yeah, yeah, this six, is offici- officially six. the third film. Though. Well, this, yeah, this is a direct sequel to Terminator 2: Judgment Day, although it is the sixth Terminator film that's been released so far. So. Do, do we want to? I mean, the first one's a classic. Oh, I one's do good. have a nice cohesive timeline. That always, always <laughs> cheers me up. Yeah, well, yeah, if you throw in the TV series as well, the Sarah Chronicle, Sarah Connor, Sarah Connor Chronicles. You've been drinking, then, uh, Steve. Oh, just, these are tongue twisters. <laughs> Sarah Connor Chronicles. Um, yeah, they uh, their timelines all over the shop. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah. we're going to come on to sequels and stuff in 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 at the end of the podcast. But yeah, um, mm-hmm. I'm going to go and see it because it's opening on Wednesday. It'll be nice and quiet. I can go to the cinema and, and have I, a go. <laughs> Maybe I can do that and Zombieland double tap in one night, and then there's you know, yeah, value for money. I might see what the, the timings are and, and go for that as well. Right. Uh, also opening Adam's Family Animation. Um, it's opening on Friday. Is this half term or something coming up? Is it? Uh, yeah. Yes, yeah, half term is imminent. It is, it is. Well, there you go. That's why that's coming out. Um, shall we move on? <laughs> I don't think there's anything to discuss here. I mean, the, the Oscar Isaac. Charlie Theron. Enjoy yourself. <laughs> right. Disc releases. Um, quite a few in 4K, Steve. Blimey. A load, actually. Um, so we've got Men in Black International, um, which is Pass. not not great. Uh, yeah, it's like, why do they bother? Other than to make some money. Uh, we got Brightburn. Interested in I this. Saw at the cinema, and I did enjoy. This is kind of like what is Superman was a bastard, basically. Um, so you know, the, the same kind of premise as Superman. A couple find a alien baby, um, raise it as their own, and then he, he discovers he has superpowers, but he's not a very nice person. Um, interesting con- interesting idea, uh, and actually quite well done. Um, I enjoyed this. That, that's, that's worth checking out. So, yeah, get it, Phil. You'll enjoy that. We've also got Scarface, which is one of our prizes uh, at the top of the show. Um, this is the 1983 uh, Brian De Palma film based on a screenplay by Oliver Stone with, of course, um, Al Pacino in the lead role. Um, at the time it came out, it was considered to be very, very violent and very foul mouth. It seems quite tame by today's standards, um, but still a cracking film with an over-the-top performance from... Uh, from Al and a good supporting cast, including a young Michelle Pfeiffer and Mary Elizabeth and Russell Antonio. Um, so, yeah, a bit of a classic these days. Um, probably one of the most Im- commonly done imp- impressions. <laughs> Say hello to my little friend. Uh, and then we've got Frozen. Uh, I know Council's very excited about this. Basically, it looks like D- Disney are unloading everything onto 4K disc as fast as they can, uh, presumably to clear the decks before they move everything on to Disney+. Plus, um, So they've been shelling out... They've, obviously, they've got Frozen here. They've been putting out all of their um, Disney films, di- recent Disney... Um, sorry, should I say recent Disney? Actually, no, that's, that's quite a lot of the catalogue stuff too. So basically, they've been putting out a lot of classic Disney stuff onto 4K disc. They've already put all the Marvel stuff on the 4K disc. They are in the process of sticking all the Pixar stuff on the 4K disc. So we've got Toy Story 1, 2, 3, and 4 hitting 4K disc. Uh, and I, I'm have it on good authority that come early next year they will but around the time of march when the, when the disc comes out for um rise of the skywalker they will dump all of the star wars films onto 4k disc as well so i think we can imagine that all this stuff will be out um by the middle of next year um, rogue one will be worth having <laughs> yeah well rogue one if you want. i enjoyed them um, force awakens it's just it went downhill a bit after Rogue one really uh anyway so toy story one two three and four are out obviously toy story four is new and the other three are coming out to coincide with it. We've got Red Heat, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and, and uh, James Belushi. Um, 
bit of a actually a bit of a good pleasure of mine to be honest. I did quite enjoy it. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's it, it's not a great film, but it's a tremendously enjoyable one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, let, let, if we separate art from the simple joy of watching something which is quite fun, it's fantastic. Love it. Yeah, yeah, with you, yeah. Steve. I I enjoyed that. Uh, Charlie's Angels. This is the uh, the film from I think 2000, wasn't it? Uh, with Drew Barrymore and Lucy Liu and uh, Who, who's it directed it again? McGee. McGee, yeah. Yes, McGee. Best known really for being ranted at by Christian Bale. <laughs> Have you heard that? On the yes, set of the Terminator, G, Salvation. Terminator Salvation, and there's a scene as a as a but some obviously the um, Christian Bale was mic'd up. Uh, for a scene, he was doing an emotional scene with Bryce Dallas Howard at the time, and the DP was moving around in his eye line, changing the lights, and he goes absolutely nuts. And the funniest thing is that he's ranting in an American accent, he's from Wales. Uh, so it's just, but it's just hearing go like, McGee, McGee, what do you think about this? He's like, how can you say the name McGee and keep a straight face? I knew so you could actually hear the producer <laughs> giggling at the background as well, which is even funnier. He goes absolutely nuts. It's like, not a nice man. Anyway, that's out. Um, <laughs> I did see it at the cinema, and uh, I think that was quite good fun, actually. I remember Sam Rockwell's in it, and he was really good. He's really good in anything he's in, to be perfectly honest. So, worth getting it. But the, the, my disc of the week out of this long list, because I watched it last night, American Gangster. My God, this looks good. Uh, it's a good film, for one thing. Great cast. Um, Des Washington and, um, and Russell Crowe heading up the cast. Directed by Ridley Scott. But it, it's, uh, it's it's a beautiful, beautiful transfer uh, shot on film. Um, it was made in 2007, um, so they've done a 4K restoration, and um, he shot it to make it look like a, a 70s because it's set in the early 70s. He shot it to look like it was shot in the 70s. It looked gorgeous, and uh, I really, really enjoyed that. It's got a new DTSX soundtrack as well. So that's my disc of the week out of that lot. Okay, Blu-ray, uh, some repetition in there, but there's also some uh, n- nice little Aru and Eureka titles. Yeah, we've got The Protector, Jackie Chan movie. I'm not familiar with that myself, but uh, we also got Dead Center from Arrow, Wonder Woman Bloodlines, uh, The Fate of Lee Khan from Eureka, Child's Play. Is that the original Child's Play? Or is that the more I recent? Think, I think that's the more recent remake, isn't movie, it? Yeah. Yeah. Eating Raoul uh, from Criterion, uh, and Dauntless Battle of the Midway. Uh why is there a the in that? I know, that should be Battle of Midway. <laughs> uh, obviously, yes. Midway, the film version of the battle by Roland Emmerich, comes out in about two or three weeks' time. So The most amazing thing about that is that it doesn't matter who directs it. If you actually look at how many... I don't know, is, is it spoilers for something which happened 70 years ago? During yeah, the, the crucial, crucial event, you can't spoil the it. The crucial but... moment where the dive bombers from USS Enterprise in Yorktown turned up. The actual number of hits they scored relative to the number of aircraft that participated is an unrepeatably high number at just the right moment. I read somewhere that if you try and replay the battle in, you know, in war games, it never ends up with a US victory. It's that it no, was absolutely. Just no, no, no. I, I, utter, I did utter it. flukes. I, I did at university, and uh, oh, yeah, the, you were... the, the, the number of ways to, to 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 win as the Japanese are many and varied. The number of ways to win as the Americans comes down to um, Independence Day levels of of, of suspension. Of well, disbelief. they got the right director, then. It's, but yeah, <laughs> well, it's absolutely what a good point, well made. I mean, if Jeff Goldblum's in it, we'll be in for a win. But um, it's. <laughs> It, it's it, it's extraordinary, and if you watch it and you think there's no way that that fewer number of aircraft could have dialed in that many critical hits, <laughs> it's unbelievable. Essentially, Utterly Japan unbelievable. Will, had lost the war from that point on, hadn't it? Yes, it's just a matter much. of time from then on, really. <laughs> yes. Uh, anyway, I'm so that's. Uh, that. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go and see Midway when it opens because uh, yeah, just as, as Ed said, just because the nature of the battle was so unlikely. Um, Streaming wise, we've got a ton of stuff out this week. Uh, one of which I'm really looking forward to, which is on Monday night on HBO on Sky Atlantic, Watchmen. So this is uh, this takes place after Watchmen, the comic or, or film, um, um, and it kind of expands the world. Now it is written by Damon Lindelof, who I haven't got a lot of time for personally, but uh, the early words been that it's really, really good. It looks interesting in the trailers, so I'm going to definitely check that out. We've got we've got Supergirl season five, The Flash season six. Daybreak season one. That's a, a Netflix show um, 
basically after an apocalypse set in a school so it's kind of like a cross between you know sort of like uh, a teenage uh, high school drama and an apocalyptic drama um that's out on i think on fr- on thursday actually i think on thursday or friday uh on netflix also out on friday Dol- dolomite is my name which is a film netflix movie with eddie murphy which looks really interesting about is real that, so that that's the same as the 70s dolomite no, yeah yeah he's playing him so it's his story um who was a, oh, was a com- stand-up comedian who, who basically did a load of films um but it looks really good in the trailers, and apparently Eddie Murphy is amazing in it. Rattlesnake, I know nothing about that. And Kaminsky Method is uh, Alan Alda and Michael Douglas, and that's got season two. I think that's also on Netflix. So a lot of on the streaming side of things this week. Okay, good stuff. Can I just say that now I'm closer to the cinema, I am going to see Le Mans 66. Because I'm of course. Probably yeah, it's a couple couple that. of weeks yet, isn't it? But uh, yeah, looking yeah. forward to that one. It should be quite good. Um, right, so that wraps up the the discs and so on. And you have noticed that in that lineup there was quite a few sequels. And uh, you know, I've written on the the runner list that Back to the Future Part Two predicted that this would be the case that cinemas would be full of sequels. All right, we didn't get Jaws nineteen, but that was kind of the point. It was oh, yes. the, <laughs> not yet, yeah. Um, and and obviously it's turned out to be the case. You know. We, we've we mentioned it a few times now that uh, Disney going through their back catalogue and just re-releasing everything or remaking everything. So I guess the, the big question has to be, what happens to Hollywood when it finally runs well, out? They run films? out of things to remake. Yeah. They'll just remake no, no, well, remakes, it, won't they? It, no, no, yeah, it's essentially, it's now carving through stuff where the remake, you don't think it was done terribly. It, there's still some great ideas that have never been successfully um, realised. Uh, and you can argue, and, and what if I'm going to put? I, shall I start by putting a positive spin on this? What it takes is for people to sit down and look, and and separate the, the 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 idea from the execution. I mean, for example, uh, that dreadful thing with Keanu Reeves, Johnny Mnemonic, or whatever it bloody yeah. was. The idea is incredible. The execution was dreadful. It was ahead of its time, wasn't it? I mean, they didn't have the technology effects-wise to really do that justice. Whereas exactly. Now, I think you're right. It would be the ideal time to have a crack at that again. So there's Probably any with, with num- Keanu still going. Oh, yeah, he, he's ageless. So there's any number of... of I, if I want to be positive before we just start criticising with every justification just how risk averse people have become if people sat down and trawled through 40 years of cinematic misfires then there's actually quite a lot to be done and there's quite a lot and and and, and there's any any suggestion that a lot of it could be quite positive um because you know, Johnny Mnemonic is an example of it being done because it, uh, of it possibly being a good idea. Because, as Steve says, the effects, the concept, weren't quite. The there. idea of cyberpunk be... now is, is 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 you know you can you can do something really interesting, can you, with the way the world has become more connected? Yes, exactly. Uh, in... And 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 things like that, I'm I'm all for. And it must be said that, I mean, I know the last one didn't do terribly well, but for every time we continue to just continue to to, to raise the bar in special effects, any re- revisiting of the of the Tron universe is all right, is all right by me, <laughs> because it just get it just has the potential to look better and better and better. And if that's then actually tied to a compelling story which you know we haven't forgotten how to do we're just less accomplished at it that's fine where the concerns to to, for me to wrap up my 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 initial thoughts on this where the concerns come is when something has reached a satisfactory end and it's like ah shite we're down this financial year round up the avengers again and we'll i don't know have tony stark's corpse struck by lightning that's that's fine but it's where they go back and they touch things that really should never be touched, like like Back to the Future. You know, there's, there's been a lot of talk of, of rebooting that. No, 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 no. Leave that alone. Or the Princess to... Bride. Yeah. <laughs> How dare they even consider the idea of remaking that? That film is yeah. already perfect. So do you think it, it, where we are in 2019, there's actually two film industries here. Now you've got Hollywood, obviously you've got Bollywood and so on, and, and Asian cinema, and, and I'm not, I'm not, you know, forgetting about them but mainly you've, you've got Hollywood 
and you've now got the streaming services who yes. up until recently have had huge budgets to play with. So do we now have creativity happening with Netflix and Amazon and so on and Hollywood just churning out the um you know the golden pl- the golden goose basically because I know they're going to get their money back. But Hollywood is still doing interesting things. Can we be clear about this? It's still really I mean I it, it's it, it there's less of it or rather you have to dig rather harder for it and it's as much symptomatic that it's just harder to find showings of of, of stuff which is this is a thing i've noticed this year i've really noticed i don't know yeah. about you steve but i've really noticed this year that there's been some stuff i really wanted to go and see yet see my, yeah my cinema because it's in the metro center they're looking at their footfall and and the, the demographic that they're likely going to get coming in even though they've got 12 screens there's been films like uh, the Bill Murray zombie thing yeah, that I really yeah, wanted to see. That. Don't die or... Yeah, it never turned up. There was a few others like Apollo 11. It never turned up in the IMAX screen. So, it, it, you know, I think Ed, Ed's made a very valid point there. It's actually getting to see some of these uh, non-mainstream films at the cinema. Well, to be honest, this is where, unfortunately, they need to bury the hatchet with streaming services. Um, and... <sighs> Okay, I'm going to sit my neck out here. If there was something genuinely interesting um, and a, a, let's say a smaller film studio made a deal with Netflix where I, I had an extra quid shoved on my bill to watch it, yeah, wouldn't hesitate. Um, well, or, perhaps, or we, I, I guess you could, you know, the Apple TV, you know, uh, model is going yeah. to be, you know, or Amazon for that matter. I mean, Netflix isn't a good example. If you look at Amazon, no. though, you can just pay to watch the film and and rent exactly. it on day and date, uh, and and I think that's going to happen pretty soon. I mean, the moment that the theatre chains, you know, are pushing for a, as wide a window as possible between um, theatrical distribution and going to home video of some sort, be it streaming or disc or whatever, um, and they like to be about three months, but that's that's compressing. I mean, two months is becoming quite common, um, and and some films have been released day and date, but they've been small scale releases. But you're right. Um, Ed, for a for a film that isn't going to play to thousands and thousands of screens, um, why not just do that? Because with any movie, the quicker you get your money back, the less you know, the better it is. You don't want to be the other the thing is that let, let, let's let's not be too hard on the cinemas here, because as Phil says, first of all, with the major ones, they've got footfall. Then, if they're being pushed to upgrade to four K, burn your shadow into the wall high high you know high dynamic range and so on and so forth if something small and arty is released that's churning feature that's chewing up a screen which could otherwise be used to show a vivid explosion fest if you like just the technology and the costs inherent to the technology mean that it has to split uh, Does it though? Because, entirely because um... not entire no not entirely but in terms of many major venues yes if you've got a a very expensive location to upkeep you want as many screens yeah, as possible an engaged in the highest revenue traffic possible and you you made the half term comment and yeah they have to pay attention to stuff like that there's you know it, it, we don't exist in a vacuum yeah. Um, well, I mean, you, you just have to look at Avengers, uh, you know, the week that that came out, um, the Metro Centre that I go to, the cinema there, they weren't showing anything else. Every screen no. was programmed, and I think it was like every half hour there was another showing starting on, yeah. on a screen. Um, and that's that's the way it was for almost a week. The cost the cost of the cinema, the cost of the rental, um, you know, is is definitely a factor because... I was quite shocked uh, last week when I went to go and see. Um, what did I go and see? Uh, oh, <laughs> Joker! We can't help you there. Yeah, Joker and um, and uh, Gemini Man. So uh, I think I may have mentioned this in last week's podcast, but those tickets were fourteen quid each. Yeah. I mean, obviously, I was I was going for free because it was uh, you know I got my, my my card, but my mate was paying twenty eight pounds to go and see two movies. Now we could have seen those films for half that cost in in Cardiff. And it gets to a point where it almost pays for us to drive to Cardiff because it's cheaper. Um, so that's because Bath's expensive. You know, the rent, renting the floor oh, space. Steve, yeah. 
see just just totally abstract thing you could try and do that like apollo 13 where you and your mate just try and creep there on the electric motor of your iris <laughs> and then you get to get to a slot and then try and like boost it but i mean obviously you'd need to set off three days before the film actually started but it would be it would be like you and tom hanks but you could you could do it in real time though couldn't you if you're going to go and see apollo 11 you can actually time it so you take off at the time that they took off. Three days to get there. Yeah. 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 Oh, it'd be fantastic. I'd pay to watch that. <laughs> Not very much, but I'd pay to watch it. On fast forward. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't watch the whole three hours, three days. Um, the thing is, like remakes and sequels aren't new. It's not like this is a modern phenomenon. I mean, they've been doing it since the beginning of cinema. I think I think Cecil B. DeMille made uh, the Ten Commandments at least twice. Uh, I know. I know. Um, uh, um, Howard Hawks. He made the same film three times. Uh, Old El Dorado, Rio Bravo, and Rio Lobo basically got the same plot, and in all of them star um, John Wayne. So it's not exactly uh, uh, unusual. Um, but what's what's scary for me is first of all films I remember seeing the first time round and now getting remade, which is always makes you feel really old. Um, but also the the what the thing that is different now is a the dot how I mean if I okay just as an example this is the top earning films worldwide so far this year number one Avengers Endgame sequel number two The Lion King remake Spider Man Far From Home sequel Captain Marvel okay that was original although part of the MCU number five Toy Story four <laughs> sequel number six Aladdin remake Hobbs and Shaw spin off Joker again I guess original but still based on existing material How to Train Your Dragon Part 3 It Chapter 2 Pokemon Detective Pikachu so that was that was new I suppose although again based on something existing Secret Life of Pets 2 Elite Battle Angel and that is based on a manga Godzilla King of the Monsters a sequel right so we're down to number 15 Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is the first original film <laughs> in that list um, so when you're looking at it you, you realise that it's not just a question of Hollywood's always made sequels and, and remakes, but that's all we're getting. It's now. all and they in do. the case yeah. of Disney. Yeah. It's really, really um, um, cynical because they are literally just taking like the Lion King and shot for shot remaking it as inverted commas live a live action. Yeah, and somebody said to me today and, and or, or the, yesterday, and it was quite a prominent point. They were discussing that, and it, and they said, "Who's going to remember that in five years? Who's going to go?" Lion King. Yeah, you know, who's, the, the the newest version. Yeah. No, who's, no, that's fair. Who's going to go back to that in five years? No, but the original will. Yeah, but Disney one point six billion dollars. They don't care whether you see it again. No, you know, no, no, no. They, 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 they don't care. They're just they're just turning the money. And if I was in their position in a capitalist society, absolutely. That's that's. I mean, I know point. it's because films cost so much money that they don't want to take a risk, and and there's that element to it. Um, if you want to see something risky, you have got to go to TV or maybe Netflix or Amazon, um, like Roma. You know, Roma. You know, people slag off Netflix. Oh, they're killing cinema. But I think it was Edward Norton who made a point this week in an interview yeah. and said, "Look, <laughs> you know, Netflix produced a black and white Spanish language film, uh, won Best Doc Director at the Oscars, and they gave it a wider cinema release than any other um, art film got that year. Even though it then immediately after a couple of weeks went to um, went to streaming. I watched um, I watched Roma in my home cinema." In 4K HDR in Dolby Atmos, so was I getting a you know I was getting as good an experience as I would have better let's be honest than I would have went to the cinema. Um, when when the Irishman comes out on streaming in a few weeks after its brief cinema release, I'll do the same thing there. Uh, you know I I think there's there's room as Ed said at the beginning of this conversation there's room for two different approaches and you can do the big Avengers Endgame cinema release but you can also do an equally um, you know a lucrative release of something smaller scale slightly cheaper, more arty um, through a streaming service. Well, this is the thing. If you make bigger, risky things, then the number of day risks taken in getting to that point are just naturally going to, 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 to diminish. And this is the case, and, and film is not a special case here. It's the same with so many other things. So within that, there, there comes the niche to do things in other ways, but just don't anticipate that you'll be driving off to your local multiplex to see it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, it was, it was interesting the other day as well, I was reading a piece so, um, with James Cameron, and we were talking about Titanic, and it was the most expensive film 
uh, ever made at that point, and it yeah. cost two hundred million. But mm. 200, now that's your average. That's your average movie. now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but we've we've discussed this time and time again. Uh, I mean, the one thing I, I I want to be positive. I mean, Michonne Newhouse. Um, I do think there's mileage in looking at stuff which just didn't land the first time and saying, "How did that not land? What could we do to make it better? And what could we do to try again?" I mean, another one that's just rolled into my head is Titan A.E. Because the story is phenomenal. The execution was at best a bit muddled. But th- there's, there what, is a what played, great film. What played against that was it was it, it was at the turning point from hand-drawn animation to CG. And I think yeah. that, that, that at that point wasn't um, glossy enough wasn't, to sell. No, it, exactly. But nevertheless, the principles and there was in many regards you don't have to work that hard because some of the executional points of the film were were, were genuinely excellent and they, they you wouldn't have to work very hard to actually make it work properly this time and being breathtakingly cynical for a moment you probably wouldn't need to actually make reference to it you wouldn't need to say it's a remake you'd simply need to take the idea and do it properly hmm. Um, you know, and that that, that just seems. Uh, I would just like people to start looking at the back catalogue, and it's not a case. It's so easy to go. Oh well, that film was a hit last time. Let's do it again. It's a bit more of a jump to go. That film wasn't a hit last time, but let's have a look at why it wasn't and see if we can do it better. Because there are only a finite. I mean, you know, music is no different. We still get lots and lots of new music. But it's very rare that cover I mean, versions I, as well. <laughs> I cannot remember. There aren't many occasions this year where I've listened to something which I would regard as genuinely innovative. But I'm okay with that because people are taking taking concepts, they're taking riffs, they're taking taking ideas, and they're doing their own thing with it. I'm hopeful, and I wasn't last year or the year before. But I am hopeful because we've had a couple of movies this year that have gone against the tide once upon a time in Hollywood being one of them, Joker being the other, where they were beautifully made, they were made by filmmakers, they had actors in them, and it wasn't relying on anything else to sell it or to reference within it or whatever. They were excellent standalone pieces of artwork and cinema. And and I'm really appreciative that we got those this year because that, that's very rare. Do nowadays. you think, though... The, that Joker would have, if it had just been called, I don't know, Fred, about a bloke who goes mad uh, and kills lots of people. I, I think it would still be. Who works still as a clown. Uh, would, it, would anyone have cared? I, I guess. I think, I think, it, I think it would because it had. changed three names in that film and it's a completely different movie. Isn't it? If you said yes, it's in New but... York, not Gotham, then then suddenly it's just about, you know, it's the king of comedy, isn't it? It's just a uh, meets taxi driver. That's basically what it is. Um, and the the actual um, association with the Batman universe is very tangential, even to the point where I'm not even sure that necessarily that Joker is necessarily the same Joker that Batman would fight, no. um, because you know my interpretation of Joker in terms but, of Batman would be a comic genius. But, but comic Steve, you're talking about genius. But you, you see, you're talking about you're still thinking about it, and you're still thinking about the where's and why not, which means that that worked as a piece of art, it worked as, as a film. Yeah, but then again, I absolutely loved Endgame. I thought that was, a, a, for, as, an, as a cinematic achievement, it, it was peerless in terms of what it managed to do, which was a lot. I thought Infinity War was it. far superior. No, Infinity War was, was fun, but I think Endgame did a great job of tying up all that stuff, uh, and it was entertaining, um, perhaps a little bit long. But... Uh, but those Marvel movies, you know, as a rule, I find them to be very entertaining. What I'm not so keen on is just literally remaking something shot for shot. It's not like you're even taking, making, well, Ed's talking about doing something that was maybe didn't work last time, but we could do it better this time. Um, take the same basic premise and do something with it. And that's fine. But if you're just taking something and just remaking it shot for shot. No, um, that's, I'm not up for that. At all. That that yeah, that seems pointless to me. No, it does. But I mean, the I suppose the but other I guess area they keep, keep going to see them. They'll keep doing them, won't they? No, but this is true. The other area where I suspect there is growth is um, there's going to be more biopic 
things. I mean, we, uh, going back to Le Mans 66, it's not necessarily what I would imagine. Biopic. I mean, biopic. Biopic yeah, sounds like well, short-sighted. Oh. <laughs> It's but yeah, they will weekend. be because it's another thing you can mine, isn't it? It's uh, yeah, but, but equally, it haven't been mined before. Um, I, I've got, so, I've got to say, I am surprised that they're going with Carroll Shelby against you know uh, Enzo. Ferrari. Well, no, I, I yeah, am too. It's... Somebody clearly managed to do the pitch of the century, especially given the people they've got involved. Yeah, but um, but nevertheless, uh, we are now. I say we, this is much more of an American thing. We are a distance away removed from Vietnam that that's probably going to start being revisited sooner rather than later. And I don't mean in, in a Rambo sense. I mean in, other, in, a, in a slightly more nuanced sense. Uh, by the same token, we are, you know, unbelievably, we're 20-odd years distant from... Um, Nearly thirty years distant from uh, from the, the first Gulf War, and and there's so there's there's any no, and then moving away from wars, there's other there's other lives, there's other events, which people will start to make use of. Um, We've already it, discussed this, Ed. Battle of Kursk. Come on, with modern technology, <laughs> get it. Get even on with it. then, it's just the heart. That's just going to be. It, it, it would be that's a cinematic Everest if someone could do justice to it but the problem with that Steve is that it's like mm, which protagonist do we root for <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the murderous right wing bastards or the murderous left wing bastards it's, mm, tough gig so unfortunately it, it lacks a certain clear cut uh, <laughs> clear cut sort of you know, flag waving element to it. I mean, in the same way that I mean, obviously, by the same token, you can you can play with that to its to to, to great effect. I mean, Eastwood's um, "Flags of Our Fathers" and "Letters from Iwo Jima." Yeah, I mean, that was that absolutely that film was extraordinarily good. Yeah. That was amazing. Um, but equally, most uh, I dare say, being called Clint Eastwood helps sell that um, it, to, to a sceptical set of money people but nevertheless the other area where we're bound to see some some further work is is is, is historical so on the bombshell ed's now going to go and write a script for uh for the butler of Kirsch, aren't you you can do it Definitely. right yeah What's that titan e or <laughs> yeah just base it on titan e <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyway uh if you have any suggestions on uh, what franchises Hollywood have yet to plunder, uh, give us your suggestions below or what you, where you would like to see the film industry go. Do you think the future is streaming or is it still a traditionally uh, a Hollywood uh, and Hollywood to the big screen before coming home? Or are we eventually in the next few years going to have the same day and date release where you can sit down in your own home cinema and watch the latest release on your big screen? Leave us your comments in the podcast uh, thread underneath this podcast on AV Forums or uh, in the comments on YouTube. But that's it for this week. My thanks to Steve Withers. It's amazing how quickly things can go from bad to total shitstorm. And Dead Sally. That's the worst goodbye I've ever heard and you stole it from a movie. Don't think... Is, was, that, was that your line? That's a genuine quote. All oh, right, okay. Uh, don't... <laughs> <laughs> I was a bit confused there. Uh, don't forget, you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook, bookmarkavforums.com for latest reviews, news and video. Plus, why not leave us a five-star rating on iTunes, but only if you enjoyed the show. Also, head over and check out our YouTube channel for videos with the latest product launches and reviews, and feel free to subscribe while you're there. I'm Phil Hinton. Thank you very much for listening, and we'll see you again next week.